Today, we're going to learn about um, the terminology we use to describe the orbits of planets around the sun uh, and some of the arrangements and the time it takes them to make their orbits. So we'll start with just a simple solar system. We'll have three orbits here. And let's go ahead and drop the Earth into that middle one uh, like that. So um, first of all, it, when we talk about the locations of planets, we'll add in a planet so the red planet is farther from the sun and the blue planet is closer to the sun. So for that blue planet that's closer to the sun, we call that an inferior planet. Uh, that has nothing to do with the status or the quality of that planet. Uh, inferior just means that its distance to the sun is less than that of Earth's. And in a similar way, the planet that's farther from the sun, we call that a superior planet. It's not necessarily better than Earth. Uh, superior just means farther away from the sun than we are. So in our solar system, Mercury and Venus are both inferior planets, and Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune are all superior planets. Uh, if you were on Mars, uh, that would change. For, from Mars's point of view, Earth is an inferior planet because from Mars, Earth is closer to the sun. So um, usually, we'll take the perspective of uh, an observer on Earth and talk about inferior and superior planets. Uh, so those planets are not standing still, obviously. They are in orbit around the sun. So if we take a look at this, we can see just the little simulated orbit here of these planets. Planets do not all move around the sun at the same rate. Uh, some move faster, some move slower. A year on one planet is different than a year on another planet. Um, so you can see as these planets go in orbit, they come into and out of different alignments. Sometimes the planet's lined up with the sun, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's on the opposite side of the sun. And so we have some names to describe the arrangements uh, or the configurations that we see planets in as they orbit. So let's start with that inferior planet. Let's just look at the blue planet. And when that planet is lined up with the sun, we call that, well, really, any time a planet's lined up with the sun, it's called conjunction. Uh, they're together. So when it's between us and the sun, we call that inferior conjunction. So it's, yes, it's an inferior planet, but inferior conjunction means it's in between us and the sun. Uh, the other arrangement is another conjunction. When it's lined up with the sun, we call this superior conjunction. That's when the planet is lined up with the sun, but it's on the opposite side. So inferior, it's between us and the sun. Superior, that planet is uh, on the other side of the sun in line with it. So it's a little uh, convoluted on the terminology. So this is an inferior planet because it's close to the sun, but it's at superior conjunction because temporarily it's on the other side of the sun. So, um, so conjunction means lined up with the sun. We could just have two different arrangements where that occurs. Now, as that planet orbits the sun, uh, if we were looking at that planet from Earth, what we would notice is that that planet gets kind of farther from the sun, then it's lined up, and then farther from the sun, then lined up again. And so we have a way of describing the distance between a planet and the sun, and we call that, uh, we measure it in, in an angle, and we call that the elongation angle. So if you find the sun and find a planet in the sky, elongation is the angle between the sun and that planet's position in the sky. Uh, what you'll notice as that planet goes in orbit is that that elongation angle can change. So, um, and at some point it hits a maximum value. So right here, this planet is at its greatest elongation angle. As it was, as it was in orbit around the sun, it would get a little farther and then a little closer and then lined up with the sun. Um, at this point, that blue planet it is at its greatest distance from the sun that will ever be in our sky, so we call that the greatest elongation angle. This is a little animation where we can see this in action. So we're on the blue planet. We're looking at the gray planet. And as they orbit, you can see that the elongation angle changes uh, as the gray planet moves around the sun. And at some point there, it hits a maximum. Looks like it might be around, let's back that up a little bit, right about here. So right around 14.4 degrees, that's the farthest that gray planet ever gets from the sun, and we would call that its elongation, or sorry, its maximum elongation angle. 
Another thing about these is, uh, depending on that planet's uh, orbital radius, the, the maximum elongation will change. So here we can see if that blue planet has smaller orbit, its maximum elongating angle would be smaller. And if it had a larger orbit, its maximum elongation angle would be larger. So we can start to get an idea about the size of a planet's orbit based on how, how far it can get from the sun or the farthest distance it can ever get from the sun. And here's something similar. We can see this kind of small orbit here. Has that, there's that maximum elongation of about 14 and a half degrees. And if the target planet's orbit gets bigger, we can see its maximum elongation angle is then bigger. And larger still, here we get an even bigger elongation angle. So we can start to measure, or at least get an idea of a planet's orbital radius based on how far it can get from the sun. So now let's look, let's look at these superior planets, planets that are farther from the sun, because there's a little variation on things when we get out here. Um, first of all, if that planet is lined up with the sun, we call that conjunction. Um, it, we don't have to worry about inferior conjunction and superior conjunction here because the red planet can never be between us and the sun. And so there's only really one kind of conjunction here, and that's when that, that planet's lined up with the sun. So it's a little bit easier when we look at these uh, far planets that are farther away from the sun. So a conjunction is when the planet's lined up with the sun. If it goes to the other side, instead of another conjunction, what we call this is opposition. Uh, and that's when we have this alignment where it's sun, earth, planet. It's called opposition because the planet is on the opposite side of the sun from us. So now let's talk about the time it takes planets to orbit the sun. So we're going to talk about a, a period, a period of orbit. And so um, there's two ways to define time when we're thinking about planets in orbit. One is called sidereal orbit. And this is just the time it takes a planet to go around the sun. So from one place around the sun back to that place again. Um, so on Earth, our sidereal period is one year. Um, you know, Mars has a different one, Venus, every planet has a different amount of time it takes to go around the sun. But this is usually what we're typically talking about when we talk about a year. Uh, a different definition or a different way to measure time in going around the sun is called a synodic period. And this is the time it takes from planets to get from one arrangement back to that arrangement again. So you can see if we're on the blue planet and we were looking at the gray planet, we would call this conjunction. So that gray planet is lined up with the sun. So when we let time go by, the synodic period is the time from conjunction back to conjunction again. So we were at conjunction, we're going around, and right here, boom, uh, this is conjunction again. And so we're right back. So the synodic period would be the amount of time it took to get from that arrangement back to that arrangement. Why do we care about that? When we're observing planets, we can't ride around on that planet and see how long it takes to go around the sun. All we get are observations that we make from Earth. So synodic period is a way to measure time for other planets when you're stuck on your planet. Um, so um, it becomes useful because we can use that number to figure out how long it took that other planet to go around the sun. So there you go. Uh, I know it's a lot of new terminology, so we're going to practice with this a little bit in a few different ways. Um, but it will be useful as we try to understand how fast things are moving in the sky and where they are and why we see them at certain times.